Uh, as I mentioned in the first session, we are kind of taking a break from our passage. What we're doing is not completely detached from it, but uh, we're not going down verse by verse right now. We're kind of looking at a few topical issues that I want to look at and go through just for your information before we proceed on. And uh, last lesson, we looked at the issue of the battle on the cross and see that God was doing some things uh, in time past when he brought Israel out of Egypt and when he took them across the Red Sea as he took them over the, 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 one of the openings of the pit of hell and things like that, which was all foreshadowing and, and typifying what he was going to do on that cross. And as well as we took a look at the, some of the things that were taking place before the cross and the preparations for the battle to take place on that cross and the, the battle that actually took place. And we didn't get to the spoils of the victory, but the Apostle Paul really sums up everything that God's able to do uh, through what took place on the cross in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 as he takes a look at God reconciling all things to himself uh, through the nation of Israel on this earth and through the body of Christ in the heavenly places. And that cross and the battle that took place on that cross provides for those spoils of victory and ultimately provides for God an, for an inheritance uh, in the saints, as Ephesians 1 talks about. And so uh, that's what we took a look at. This lesson, what we're going to do is take a look at some terminology and what this terminology means and what it indicates uh, if you read here again in verse uh, 24 of Romans 3, Paul says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And you can survey and go through Paul's epistles, and it's a, 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 a host of times that he mentions this terminology, in Christ. And uh, it's important for, under, for us to understand what it means to be in Christ. It's the foundation of of our Christian life. It's the foundation of how to walk. We walk in Christ. And to know what that means. Uh, if you look at Romans 5, Romans 5 and look at verse 12, he's going to explain this in more detail when we get to this portion of Scripture here in the book of Romans. But uh, you can see what he compares it to, what he means by being in Christ. There's only one other place you could be in. And that's what he describes here in Romans uh, 5, verse 12, and uh, through the end of the chapter. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all, that all have sinned. And that one man that he talks about there in chapter 5, verse 12, is the one man, Adam. And by nature, we take on the characteristics of Adam, what it means to be in Adam. God judicially places men in one of two places, in Adam or in Christ. And we start out being in Adam. And we went, uh, we went through what it means to be in Adam last time. I'll quickly review before we get into what it means to be in Christ. And so again, in Romans 3 and verse 24, for the very first time, we get this expression or this terminology of what it means to be in Christ. Uh, come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. A verse that we looked at last time, not last lesson, but last week. First Corinthians 15. And look at verse 45. He says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And so again, he brings up the first Adam, Adam, and the last Adam, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're, again, we'll look at more of why it's Adam and Christ when we get to Romans chapter 5. Uh, jump down to verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from, from heaven. And so again, you have the, the two issues, in Adam or in Christ, or being of Adam or of Christ. But again, this terminology of being in Christ Jesus is everywhere. If you look at the same uh, chapter, jump back to verse 31 and see what he writes here. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have, where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. And so he again, he uses the issue of our identity in Christ and what he, has, what he has in Christ as the basis of some of his arguments and his correction, his reproof, as well as some of the riches that he has in Christ 
uh, he describes all those things. You can come to 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, and look at verse 21, uh, 20. I mean, they're all over the place in this, uh, this chapter. Uh, look at verse 17. Verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if any man be, where? In Christ, he is a new creature. A characteristic that you have of being in Christ is you're a new creature. All things are pa old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's a little different. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now here's the big one that I want to uh, notice, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God, where? In him. And so again, and you'll, as you read through Paul's epistles, you'll just find this expression of being in Christ or being in Christ Jesus in a, a, a number of uh, places. And it's a foundational issue that we're beginning to learn in Romans chapter 3. It's going to be expounded upon as we go on, but it's a, a very important issue. If you don't understand who you are in Christ, and the, the basis in, uh, of, which is the basis of how to live your life in Christ, then there's a lot of things that you don't understand. And I want to provide for us a, a brief synopsis of what it means to be in Christ before we get into the further doctrines of what that means. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at. Let me jump ahead here. I was just going to briefly review of where we're at. La uh, uh, lessons ago, probably a few months ago, you can come back to Romans chapter 3 with me. We took a look as we wrapped up the second part of the gospel, which is the issue of the escape tactics that man's going to use to try to escape the wrath of God as they are made aware of it by us sharing with them that information. Paul sums that up, all up with his final summation in verses 19 through 20 of Romans chapter 3. And what we did is, what I did then is I summarized what, it, what we've gone through and what it means to be in Adam. Uh, every, all the little details that we've got make up who we are in Adam. And we broke that down in the three sections. One is what it means to be in Adam. You are condemned. You are naturally condemned in God's sight because of your standing in Adam, as God views you in Adam. As you saw there in Romans 5, he says uh, in, in verse 12, there wherefore as by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And when we get there, we're going to see that when sin entered the world, what, there's something that God did judicially that provided that all, uh, all men of sin and therefore deserving of death. And he does that for a specific reason, and we'll, we'll understand it when we get here. But again, it's, it's almost like he says, okay, Adam, you sinned, death comes by your sinning, and now all men are going to die, and all men, uh, because all men have sinned. And before even another man comes on the scene, he proclaims that and declares that that's the way it would be, and he puts all men in Adam. And again, we'll get into the reason why he does that uh, when, as we get to this passage. But So what we're just seeing, in Rome, what we saw in Romans 1, 2, and 3 is the, the details of these things. And the very first issue that we saw was the issue of condemnation, that we're all condemned, judicially condemned in Adam. The second issue is that we're an abomination. And we went through these verses, Romans 5, 16, 18, and Titus 1, 15 through 16. We're also an abomination to him. And that goes into the issue of that he cannot, we cannot be in his presence. We are, it's the opposite of being holy. We, it's not something that pleases him, but it's something that repulses him. That's naturally what we are. We don't do anything or are anything that pleases God as we are, as our standing in Adam. And these are the things that we need to be saved from. The third issue was we're alienated from God. And, and as Gentiles, we were twice dead Gentiles. We were 
not only dead in, uh, in our flesh and what our flesh could produce, but we were dead in the uncircumcision of our flesh. We were part of the uncircumcision. And so we were alienated from the life of God. And you see that in uh, Colossians 1.21 and Ephesians 4.18. Again, I'm not going into these things in great detail because we've already went through this. These, that, these three issues then can be broken down into three more. And this is what makes up once you understand who you are in Adam and these components, what we're going to get in Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and onward is the opposite of that. And, and even, even more wonderful than who we were before in Adam, which is a kind of an obvious thing. So our condemnation is broken down into three parts. One, we are under sin. We have, Paul talks about that in verse Three, or verse 9 of Romans 3. He says, What then are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And that's the part of our being condemned. We're under sin and therefore we're, we're condemned. The flip side of that is that, remember that ledger that we were making before, the debit and credit side? We're under sin. What we have in our debit is sin. Sin, sin, sin. And on the credit side, we have no righteousness. We have no righteousness that measures up to God's righteousness. And that's what he says there in verse 23 of Romans 3. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The third issue is that we are enemies of God. Because we're under sin, and there's, we have no righteousness before God. We are the enemies of God. And you can see the flip side of that in Romans 5 and verse 1. When we actually get to it, he's going to say, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer enemies, at, uh, uh, enemies with God and therefore deserving of the wrath of God, but we're going to have peace with God. When it gets into the abomination aspect, again, you're going to have to go like this <laughs> to look at them, but that's all right. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you know <laughs> what, they, what they are. Uh, the abomination, the first part is that you're the servants of sin. And a servant is an issue of what you serve. And it goes into the issue of your conduct and behavior. How you live and conduct yourself. And what, you, what we were in Adam, we were the servants of sin. There was nothing that we could do to please God. We served sin. We were under the mastership and dominion of sin. And we're going to see the opposite of that when we get into Romans 6, 7, 8. Is that we're no longer under the mastership of sin. That we don't automatically have to yield to sin's strength and, and to give in to the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And, but that's the issue of the abomination. We are the servants of sin. We, all we could do is sin. Paul says, iniquity unto iniquity. That's the fruit that we had. Uh, the second issue under abomination is that we were dead to righteousness. We couldn't bring... The first one is the issue of our, our standing. We're just under sin. There's no right, we, have no, we don't measure up to the righteousness of God, and therefore enemies of God. This one gets into the, our conduct and our living. And so all we do is sin, and we don't. We're dead to righteousness. We can't perform any fruits of righteousness. The third aspect is we follow the course of this world, and that's set forth in, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We follow the course of the world, and the one who charted that course and is the uh, overseer of it is the adversary, the prince of the power of the air. And that's what we follow. That's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you say, no, I didn't follow the adversary. You did. We all did before we were justified. Uh, whether you understood that or believed that or not, or whether you're actively engaged in doing it, if you're not following God, you're, the alternative is the adversary in his course of this world. And eventually we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that again and see uh, some of those issues of what he established there in Genesis 1 uh, when, when the time is, is right to do that. Regarding our alienation, we were Gentiles in the flesh. Uh, we, you can see that in Ephesians 2, 11 through 12. Uh, and Colossians chapter 2 talks about that as well. Uh, the second issue is that we belong to Satan. Uh, so not only did we follow, again, we followed the course of his world, of this world, but we also belonged to Satan. We were his possession. That, that, that servants of sin were, were also belonged to the adversary himself. He had dominion. He had ownership. He had the legal right to us. And that's some of the things that we looked at last lesson regarding the battle of the cross. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ got that legal right back. 
doesn't mean that you're justified or reconciled unto him, but now he has the capacity to, to reconcile you back to, back to himself. He can offer you that reconciliation. But nevertheless, our alienation, we belonged to Satan. And the last one, we are good citizens of Satan's kingdom. Uh, you, ever, you, know, you always hear the people say, well, I'm a good person. Yeah, you're, you're a good person, all right. But you're a good person of because you follow the course of the world and this is your identity in Adam and what you belong to. You're a good citizen of Satan's kingdom. You're laboring with him to get his objectives accomplished. You labor with him to uh, fulfill his plan and purpose that he has for this world. And that's who we were in Adam. And so when he talks about walking after the flesh, these are some of the things that, uh, that we did. As we walked after the flesh, uh, some of the things that we were a part of. And the whole goal is to change all of these things. And when he provided the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, and that baptism that he's going to talk about in Romans 6, is the mechanical means by which he takes you out of Adam and places you into Christ, and you get a whole new identity in Christ by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for you. And that identity now is what I want to talk about. Again, look at verse 24 of Romans 3, just again to get ourselves acquainted with the terminology. What God is going to be able to do for you and freely do for you is all wrapped up into Christ. Christ is his power, it's his, it's his wisdom, Therefore, everything that we get and we're beneficiaries of is in Christ. And that's also where we need to be. So look again, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. He could have just stopped. He could have just said through redemption. But he says through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. A specific redemption in a specific person uh, in a specific event to, to provide for some specific things for us. Now, here's the opposite of, of being uh, in Adam. We therefore get to be in Christ. We already looked at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. Let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 1. Look at Philippians chapter 1. We're just going to run through verses here. To get acquainted with this, and we'll deal with it more, more as we go on in our edification. Look at Philippians 1, and look at verse 1. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the saints of Jesus Christ, to all the saints where? In Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. All the saints, if you're a saint, if you're a sanctified one, you are a saint because you're in Christ Jesus. And that's the new identity, again, that we get. Uh, come with me to Philemon. Philemon in verse 6. This stems from his first epistle, Romans, and goes all the way to his last epistle, Philemon. Uh, let's start at just verse 4. Philemon 4. There's only one chapter, so it's verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is where? In you, where? In Christ Jesus. So every good thing that is in you is in Christ Jesus. It, there's good things that we're going to avail ourselves of, but that's only possible because we're in Christ. Okay? And this is, again, I know we're just talking about it very generally right now, but I want to get you acquainted with this because this, this issue of being in Christ is supposed to take over your mind. It's supposed to be your mind. Um, we're going to see that in Romans 8. He talks about being spiritually minded and minding the things of the Spirit. Well, minding the things of the Spirit is not some phenomena or unction or feeling within you. It's the doctrine of you being in Christ. That's what you're supposed to mind. 
God sees you this way now. He doesn't see you in Adam anymore. He doesn't see you're not condemned. You're not a you're not a servant of sin. You're not a good citizen of, of, of Satan's kingdom anymore. This is now who you are, and you need to start seeing yourself that way and focusing and minding those things. It's the first step of walking in Christ is thinking about who you are in Christ, minding those things. And there's going to be a whole bunch of other things that, uh, that gets added to that, but that's the foundation of things. So that's why I want us to get acquainted with this. So again, we have a, another pie chart. It's going to be uh, obviously different than being in Adam. And the first issue that is dealt with of our identity in Christ is the very issue that we're looking at in Romans 3, which is the issue of justification. <coughs> justification is being, being declared righteous in God's sight. It's the opposite of condemnation. Uh, look at Romans 5 again. Come back to Romans 5. And look at verse 16. Uh, Romans 5, if you don't have a, a good understanding of it right now, as we go through it, hopefully it will provide for you, uh, it's, it will become one of your favorite passages. Uh, there's a lot of, if you don't go through it slowly, you'll probably get confused, because I know when I read through it, I just read through it, I, you, the wording and things like that can kind of confuse you, but if you just take your time and study it, uh, there's some wonderful things being dealt with here. But look at Romans 5, and look at verse 16. So again, he's comparing Adam and Christ, okay? And not as it was by one that sinned, so that's Adam, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to what? Condemnation. So what Adam did, the judgment upon what Adam did was to condemnation, all right? And then he says, but the free gift, which is what we, what, uh, what's extended to us in the gospel of Christ, but the free gift is of many offenses, until what? Justification. So you see God's judicial power against that one sin of Adam was condemnation. But what he's bringing out here is that his judicial power regarding what in Christ is greater because it doesn't take on just one sin, it takes on, or one offense, but it takes on many offenses. And so that's what he's bringing out here. But again, that justification is the opposite of condemnation, and that's the very first issue that, we're, that you learn in your edification here in Romans 3 is the issue of justification. And your identity in Christ, by being in Christ, you, get, you are justified. And that breaks... Uh, sorry, I thought we were going to go through that first. I'll, we'll go through all the three, and then we'll break down each three. And so justification, the second issue is the issue of sanctification. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 and look at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. If you remember, when we were going through uh, a few lessons ago, we went back to Romans 1 and we talked about the spirit of holiness and that that's that it's a that spirit of holiness is resident within the new covenant back there in Jeremiah 31. And what that new covenant set for was uh, perfect justification and it provided for perfect sanctification. And in the gospel of Christ, those two issues and then uh, uh, exaltation is a part of this one as well, which is the third uh, the third one up on there. Well, that new covenant, being a beneficiary of that, provides for these things. In Romans, we start to learn about these three things. And they're set forth to us. Um, and really, this one gets itself underway. Sanctification. And how to live pleasing unto God. And you now have the capacity to do that. You can actually do things that please God's just, uh, pleases God's justice. However, the Corinthians... They were sanctified, but they weren't living as such. 
And Paul's introduction sets forth that very issue. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are what? Sanctified, but where? In Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So they're sanctified in Christ Jesus and they're called to be saints. They're supposed to, this is your position of being sanctified in Christ. But now you're also supposed to walk consistently with that, whatever that means right now. You're supposed to live in accordance with your identity in Christ. The third one I, I briefly mentioned is the issue of exaltation. We're not going to go there and look at those. You can write them down for reference. But that's uh, exaltation. That's the issue of glory and the resurrection. Uh, and there's details that are described within those. So now let's look through the three components of each of these of uh, justification. If you remember this ledger that we had, debit and credit, your debit was just sin, 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 sin. Again, our identity in Adam is that we were under sin and we had no, no righteousness before God. We had no plus rights. We had no credit to our account. That's who we were. That was components of who we were, were in Adam. Well, now in Christ, this sin and the wages of it has been forgiven. That's the first component of our justification. Our justification. And what do you think the second component is going to be? We have the righteousness of God. We had no righteousness of God before. But we're going to have the righteousness of God. And if you remember 1 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5 there, that last verse, where the righteousness of God in him. Come with me and look at this. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll just go through a few of these. Uh, or maybe just one or two, but not all of them. Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 7. He says, in whom we have what? Redemption through his blood. And then notice what he describes that redemption through his blood as. It's in uh, commas there, which can be, a, uh, they're like parenthetical commas. The forgiveness of sins. Uh, look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2.13. Colossians 2.13. He says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, what? All trespasses. If God is going to give this to you, if he is going to give to you, impute unto you, his righteousness. If he is going to do that, then there can't be one sin on your account. And therefore, he has to forgive all your sin. The, 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 the smallest sin on your account, he's got to deal with. All of them, he has to forgive because his righteousness is not compatible with any sin. Therefore, all this theology and doctrine that's out there that teaches you uh, if you sin after you're saved or something like that, or if you have a, a life of habitual sin after you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and you're really not justified, all these things, you really didn't believe, that's a bunch of hogwash because the moment you believe, you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your all sufficient Savior, that He paid the debt and penalty of your sin and gave you His righteousness. He did just, he ju he did just that. He forgave all your sin. The issue of a habitual life of sin is not an issue of justification. It's an issue of sanctification, which we're going we're gonna to get to. But nevertheless, these theologians and, and things like that, these Bible I can't, accredited people make it a justification issue when it's not that at all. You've been forgiven all your sin. It's completely and fully dealt with. 
And it has to be if he gives you his righteousness. So all your sins have been forgiven in Christ. The second issue, therefore, is that you've been imputed with Christ's righteousness. And that's the passage we're in right now. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In verse 20, there's, we cannot be justified by any deeds of the law. Verse 21, the righteousness of God is, is now manifest. It's equal to the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, verse 20, uh, 22. And then in verse 24 and 25, he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say it, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Uh, look at Romans chapter 4 and look at verse 24. Romans 4 verse 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, he's talking about the righteousness of God, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, so that our justification is, is made up of these two components. Justification is the process by which God forgives you all your sin and imputes his righteousness unto you. Therefore, providing for you to be declared righteous in Christ, in his sight. So that ledger switches in Adam. All your sins forgiven, past, present, and future, and you've been given the righteousness of God in Christ. The third component of that is the issue of your permanent at one or reconciliation in Romans 5, 1. Uh, and then he's, he deals with it in detail in verses 6 through 11 and so on uh, there in Romans chapter 5. This issue of atonement, look at Romans 5. Romans 5 again. And look at verse 11. What Romans 5 is designed to do is provide you the much assurance in Christ that this position can never change. Once you're in Christ and you've been forgiven all your sin and been imputed His righteousness, it can never change. It's irrefutable. It's immutable. It cannot be changed in one, in, in, in any matter, in any manner. Uh, look at verse 11 of Romans 5. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the what? Atonement. If you break up that word, it's at one minute. You're at one with Christ. The, the very status and position that Christ has before God, you possess that now. And God is definitely not going to take and get his son out of his sight and change his status at all because of what he did, what he went through. And what he was, he was able to do. Well, you've been identified in him. Therefore, he looks at you as if you did that. You went through the cross. And, and that's what we're going to learn in Romans 6. You've been baptized into his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And now he sees you in Christ. And he sees you in a status and a position with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who you are in Christ. That's how you need to start viewing yourself. That's how you need to start thinking about yourself now even in the midst when you do still sin is yeah I still sin I've just committed a sin you need to walk consistently with who you are in Christ and that works both before you sin when, when sin is in its lust stage and you're supposed to mind the things of the spirit I'm dead to sin but after uh, sin is brought forth and is conceived you, after that, are still, you're supposed to walk consistent with who in Christ and, and mind that you're forgiven and that you're dead to sin. Change your mind in connection with that and progress on. It's provided you the capacity to not be all down in the dumps. 
I can never do anything unto God and all these. No, he's provided for you the capacity to let that be done because it's been dealt with and to go forward and move on. We'll get to that when we get to Romans 6 as well. So that makes up the three components of our justification. You've been forgiven all your sins. You've been imputed the, righteous, the Christ righteousness. And you have a permanent at one mint. You don't, what we're going to see there in Romans 5 is you don't have... What God does when he places you in Christ, he doesn't give you Adam's position before he sinned. He doesn't just reverse what, he did, what Adam did. He doesn't do that. That's what you'll be taught in seminary and things like that. When I went to Northwestern College, that's basically what they teach. And they teach that by saying, well, after you're saved, all your past sins are forgiven but your future sins aren't forgiven, you need to confess those ones. And that provides for you to be... You, all your past sins are forgiven, but now you sin, you're out of fellowship with God, and you need to confess those in order to get back into fellowship with God. No. That's, that's erroneous. And that's what you would think if you were in a position with Adam. Because Adam, he was in fellowship with God. He sinned, he's out of fellowship, he gets back in. And, and things like that. But he, didn't get, he just didn't reverse and put you back in Adam before he fell. No, he puts you in Christ. It's a, a permanent thing, a permanent position and status that you have. And all your sins are forgiven every time. All the time. You're, that's who you are now. Now let's go into sanctification. Sanctification starts to move into. There's two parts of sanctification. We'll just just very very oversimplifying it. We are in sanctification. There's a positional and there's a I'm going to say functional or practical aspect of sanctification, okay? The first two parts that we're going to look at are part of the positional. The first one is the issue that we are dead to sin, okay? Dead to sin. And the second aspect of our position is we're alive unto God. Alive, I'll just say alive to God. The third issue is, uh, goes into functional, which is the issue of, of being a son of God. Which provides for you to put your position in the practice. You're not given a position in Christ, a sanctified position in Christ, for it just to sit there. I use the analogy, and it's probably not a good one. I always use the analogy of Frankenstein regarding sanctification. Frankenstein's put together, right? We're taught that we're the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus. He works this issue out. We're going to learn all about his operation that he does. Takes you from in Adam, he puts you in Christ, gives you all these things. He works it. He makes you dead to sin and alive unto God. He provides for you life. He quickens you. Frankenstein, he gets up, right? And, and, and there's, there's, he's, he's got life. But that's only, he, he's alive. Now he's got to walk. That's what we're going to get into when we get into Romans chapter 8. You, you're going to learn this, these issues first. But now this position has to walk. It has to go about the room. It has to do life. It's been given that life, but now it's got to function. So Frankenstein, he gets up. I've never seen Frankenstein. This is what I'm assuming that it is. So... Frankenstein gets up and then he starts walking. He starts going places. And that goes into functional life. And so we're going to learn some wonderful things here. But this is only the first stage that provides for us to be a son of God, which involves an array of things, a, a, a numerous amount of things, how to live pleasing unto God the way that he wants us to. So again, the very first issue is you're dead to sin. 
You now have the capacity to restrain sin in your life, not by the flesh, not by you trying to restrain sin in your life, but by reckoning who you are in Christ, that, it's been, that you've been baptized into Christ's death. Your sin is on that cross. It's dead. Functionally, it's dead. You can now restrain sin in your life based upon you being dead to sin, given that position. But also, that's just one half of it. But also, you're alive unto God. So not only do we just restrain sin in our life, but we're supposed to live unto God. We've been made alive unto God, so we are to live unto God. And so you've been given that, and the details of that life, that newness of life that you have, are going to be given under the issue of being a son of God and you being adopted. So again, the first component of sanctification is you're dead to sin, you're alive unto God, and that you're, you're sons of God. Um, let's look at this real quick. Look at Romans 6 and look at verse 11. In Romans 6, verses 1 through 11, he is going to teach you this issue. Romans 6, 1 through 11. He's going to teach you this issue, and he sums it up here in verse 11. Look what he says. Likewise, reckon. Reckon is a word that you count this to be true. You count this to be true no matter what the situation or circumstance tells you. You go based upon what has just been taught to you. That's what reckon means. It doesn't just mean to count true, but to count true no matter what, what's taking place. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he's going to go on and, and teach you how to put this life into motion okay and what he goes into in verses 12 all the way through the end of chapter 7 in essence he teaches you you cannot put this position into practice by going underneath the law Frankenstein gets up he's been he's been given this life and if he were to put himself, this doesn't make any sense at all, but he puts himself under an operation, uh, a, a different system of functionality, which would be the law, and he's not going to be able to functionally live under God. It's a different operating system that doesn't provide for you to live and please God. That law doesn't allow it. But you're supposed to then put your, uh, put your position under an operation of grace which provides you to live pleasing unto God and satisfy Him in the details of your lives. Whereas before, when you were in Adam, you couldn't do that in one ounce, one iota. So He gives those two issues there in Romans 6, 11. Come with me to Romans 8. Romans 8, and then get to verse 14. He says, for as many are, as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the, what? Sons of God. Not just a child of God. That's important, but a son of God. And he's going to explain that, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the adoption is the issue of taking your own child and bringing him up, and he then becomes a son or a daughter, and... You start, the father starts teaching them his business. And this life that we've been given, there's a whole bunch of things that God wants to do with it. And he's going to teach you that through being a son of God, through this adoption process. And this adoption process has certain things that he's going to go through. One, two, three, four. And, and that's going to provide for us our edification, which is, okay, what's the very first component of my edification? I need to get that first, the second, the third, the fourth. And all those things are conforming you to the image of his dear son, the image of Christ. That's the life, that's the functional life that we're able to have is being a son of God. So that goes into sanctification. But all that works something. Even in this verse, look what he says in the same passage. He talks about the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father, verse 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You've already been taught that, but now he wants to teach you this, what it means to be a son of God. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also what? 
glorify together. Your positional life put into functionality, put into practice, provides glory, provides exaltation, provides a reward. And that's naturally what he leads into. And that's the third component of our identity in Christ, what it provides for. And those three issues are one, you, we, today in this dispensation of grace, we become part of the one new man. You can read about that in Ephesians. And that one new man has a destination, not for the earth, but for the heavenly places. That's what Paul starts with in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And look at verse 3. Look what he does in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Where? In heaven places where? In Christ. So he takes where you are in Christ and then he brings out, he's bringing out a specific component of your identity in Christ which is your exaltation and that's in the heavenly places being a part of the one new man. And that one new man is taught in Ephesians 2, 11 through 15. You can go through that yourself. I want to I wanna move on and get all this. Uh, the second issue, issue of our exaltation is that we have a citizenship in Christ's heavenly kingdom, in the heavenly places. Uh, look at Ephesians. Uh, look, come with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now, he's not going to use the word citizenship here. It's conversation. But the, uh, just for right now, this will, this will get the point across. Look at Philippians 3 and verse 20. For our conversation is where? In heaven from whence we also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to become, remember the one before this, in Adam we belong to Satan. Uh, let's look at another one real quick. Look at Colossians 1. And you can see, regarding this issue, exaltation, you can see what it was from Adam to in Christ. Colossians 1. And look at verse 12. He says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. We belong to Satan, the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And then he goes on, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Our justification and the redemption, our forgiveness of sins and his imputed righteousness, provides this is one step in providing for us our exaltation, our glory with him. And we, again, we become the citizens in Christ's heavenly kingdom. The last issue of our of exaltation and of the totality of being in Christ is that we have a heavenly vocation and impact. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech, ye, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. A vocation, never think about vocational school. A vocational school teaches you information and you take that information and put it right away into practice. And this is actually a good segue into the Lord's Supper. And what that's doing is providing... See, a vocational... That's what you do. If you're in any kind of... Dirk, what's a vocational like mechanic school? I don't know. A, 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 a mechanic. You go to a vocational school. What they ought to be doing, because a vocation does this, you go, you go in the textbook, they have probably pictures, they tell you what the parts do and how they work and all these things. And then right away, what you've learned in the classroom, you go to the garage. You go to the garage and you figure that all out. And all that's doing for you is providing you experience so that when you get into what your vocation provided, 
when you get into the the realm in which you're going to utilize that experience and that education, the job, the workplace, that you then can take those issues and put them into play. And so our, our vocation, we have a heavenly vocation. Now I said this is a good segue into the, to the Lord's Supper because I want to do something. I, I, I draw pictures. I don't know that sometimes they're silly, but sometimes they help. That's why I try to do this. Sometimes I'll draw something, I say, that makes no sense. It doesn't line up with what I'm saying. But our vocation, now just please bear with my drawing capabilities and, and all this. You know the term that Paul uses, edification? He talks about this building, right? And a building we've talked about before has... has components to it, right? You have the first level, second level, the third level. Just put it very simply. When Paul talks about the vocation and the heavenly places, and before then Ephesians 1, he talks about principalities, powers, mights, thrones, dominions, and so on and so on. Those are positions of, of leadership, rulership, of government in the heavenly places, okay? Let's just say this was principality, this was a power, this was a might, a throne, dominion, and then there's a whole bunch underneath that. Every name that is named, okay? Your edification, as we go through it, is providing you, each, each level that you're at, where you're at, is qualifying you for one of these positions. Right now, as we go through our edification, if we're committed to the learning and understanding of it, as well as to putting it into play, put it into practice, I get taught in Romans 12, be not slothful in business. And that goes against the, what the world does. And that's easy to, to check off and say, oh yeah, I do that, I'm pretty good at my job. Well, that's not what God means by that. But nevertheless, I, I'm committed to learn what it means not to be slothful in business what business is to God, what the opposite of being slothful is, and I, I'm committed to being edified in that. I learn that, and also I'm gaining, I go, and it's a vocation. Now I'm going to my business, I'm going to my job, and I'm utilizing that. that those two components of learning it and putting it into practice is qualifying you because each one of those things, you right now, by taking that issue of not being slothful in business, it's qualifying you for an operation in the heavenly places. You might not know what it is, but you're going to be able to take that issue and by the experience of it, take that issue and put it into play in the heavenly places for all eternity. Your edification right now in the maybe hundred years that you have on this life can provide for you eternal reward and eternal consequences. And not only that, I was just speaking to Cody before that, before the, uh, the session. Hold on, I'll bring this all the, the barrel uh, regarding the Lord's Supper. I don't know if you ever heard the parkour. You probably never heard. Parkour is these, these people who, the world is their playground. And they do flips and jumps and they run off roofs and they land and they do all this kind of cool stuff. But one of their mottos is, the world is your playground. In your edification right now, by taking this information that we're given in Paul's epistles and couple it with what we are and, and who we are in this world, the, the world is our, voca is our training ground. The government that you're under, doesn't matter what type of government you're under, the government you're under and how you respond to that government is a part of your vocation. It can work for you eternal reward. The local assembly is a part of your training. Taking the information and applying it in the local assembly is part of your training. It can qualify you for a position of authority. The relationships you're in, whether you're a friend or a business or marriage, family, the relationships that you're in, can, you can utilize for training of putting on display your edification. Everything that you experience in this world can be utilized 
to qualify you for a position of authority. Not just live in the heavenly places. You can get that. You get that by just being saved. But you learn that in Romans 1 through 8, 13. You learn those very issues. You learn how to get in the heavenly places by Romans 1, 8 through 13. But the rest of Romans 8, 14 through the end of his epistles qualifies you by learning it and putting it in the details of your life. Qualifies you for this. Because if you can do those, you're building up skills to be utilized in the heavenly places. That's an amazing thing. And the reason why he's doing that, because guess who's especially up in these two tiers right here? The adversary and his cohorts. Satan. And he's going to reconcile that to himself. He's not just going to reconcile the heavens to him. He's got to reconcile the heavenly places. A principality is a place. A power. All these things are places. And he's got to reconcile the heavenly places. And he's going to take Satan and his cohorts out. And he doesn't want just some Christian to fill those places. He wants a qualified Christian to fill those places. An experienced, wise, in the edification process to fill that place. The question is, do you want it? Do you want to get it? Because by the time when we hit Romans 8.13, if you don't want it, you really don't have to come no more. You're in, you'll be in heavenly places. You'll, you're, you got it. But do you want more than that? And you can get more than that. And it, it's almost inconceivable, the fact that we could get more than what we have regarding our justification. But he wants you to have more than that. This is the issue of being a joint heir with Christ. Not just a, a child of God, but a joint heir over his father's inheritance. Not just the, the heavens that this would be, but the heavenly places. And the reason why I go into all that is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, the, Christ's death on this cross provided for you to not only be saved and get to the heavenly places but it provided for you to go through this process the edification process which qualifies you for one of these positions of authority right where adversary the adversary and his cohorts are in right now and when we celebrate the lord's supper what we ought to be doing is celebrating our maturity in the doctrine whether it's this brick, Paul talks about in Romans 6, that you have believed the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. There's forms of doctrine that provide a building on top of building process. And it's like there's bricks. And then there's another layer. And then there's another layer on top which is all qualifying you for glory, higher, more and more glory. And what the Lord's Supper does, what it ought to be, is a celebration of an understanding of a form of doctrine that says we're one more step mature in the edification and we're coming for you. And it's all because of what Christ did. We show the Lord's death till he come and his death provided all of this for us. And we're coming for you. We're making an open show of you that we're being edified to take your place. He's going to displace you and replace you with a twice dead Gentile that he justified, sanctified, made you spiritually fit. And now we're going through our edification process to not only just be in heaven and live with him forever, but to rule and reign with him forever. I jump out of my seat. I don't, we can all do, you can all jump up if you want. I, this is amazing. And whether you believe it or not, or you don't want to have anything to do with it, that's fine. But this is absolutely astonishing that he can do this. And you, I, you won't get this anywhere else. 
not because we're special or anything, but because we believe God's word, no matter if you think that, oh, being a principality with the Lord Jesus Christ, that's sacrilegious. No, that's what he provided for. And if you're not going to attain it, then the cross, it, it, it's one thing to be justified, but it's another thing to utilize what he died for to get you. Don't make that a waste. Fill it up. Take full advantage of what he died for you for. It wasn't just to save you and so you can be in the, heaven, in the heaven. It was so that you could be in a specific position in the heavenly places to reconcile the, the heavenly places back unto themselves and have them function in a capacity that they never were. Never were. And when I bring up issues of how you think about our government and how you think about marriage and how you think about uh, friendships and how you think about the local assembly and, and how you deal with those things, I don't bring them up to be legalistic and say you got to do this and you don't got to do this. No, I bring those things up because if you learn the principles of how to deal with all those things, look what's for you. And you might have baggage upon baggage upon baggage of how you used to view something and respond to something, but how bad do you want this? Because if you want this, then you'll get rid of the baggage. Like that, just get rid of it. I don't want that stuff. I don't want to think about I don't, the, the way the world views government, the way the world views marriage, the way the world views friendship and church. I don't want that. Because none of that helps me get this. But I will go through the edification and be committed to it. And although it might hurt to go against my flesh and the thoughts that I have regarding all those things, I'll get rid of it because I want this. And I want to take full advantage of what you provided for on that cross. Justification, salvation from the debt and penalty of your sins, how grand it is, was only a means to this end. And it's the same issue in Israel's program. What's the whole goal? What's the end of the timeline? The whole goal is to get him that kingdom. Yeah, he's got to make him spiritually fit to get in there, justify and sanctify. But the whole goal is to rule and reign on the earth. That was the whole goal back here with Adam. Have dominion over the earth. Rulership. Reigning. Lord's Supper ought to be a celebration of issues that we have just learned, the doctrine that we have just learned that edify us. Not just make us feel good. Not just say, oh, that's a good message, preacher. I appreciate those things, don't get me wrong. But to say, no, that edified me and have some intelligence and understanding what that means. Edify, yeah, to build me up, conform me to the image of Christ and provide and qualify me for a position of authority. And not just to talk about that and me preach it to you, but to share it with one another. And when we do that, you can do that, I can do that with Dean, and we can do that, and we can make an open show to the heavenly places and things like that, but when we do that as a local assembly, you're involved in an operation that cannot take place anywhere else besides right here, right now. Because this is the time that we gather. This is the time as a whole local assembly, we can make an open show to those heavenly places that, hey, not just me, not just Dean, but the whole assembly, we're coming for you. We're coming to take your place. And you better get scared. And not as a, a false confidence in and of ourselves. No, but because the doctrine is going to provide that. And not just to lord it over someone. I always make sure to qualify this. Not to lord it over someone and say, hey, I'm going to get the principality and no one else is it. No, you won't get that position if you have that attitude. The very first thing you learn in your edification is don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. You don't leave others out. You make sure and bring them along. And that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. And in doing that, and sharing the doctrine with one another, making sure we all have that understanding, the adversary is looking down, not just at one, two, or three of us, but all of us, and saying, Oh no. I had him confused regarding justification. I had him confused before regarding sanctification. Now they understand that. Now they understand the edification process. And they're going to. Oh boy. I'm, I'm, that's what the doctrine teaches you. We're a spectacle, Paul calls us. 
and the angels are looking down and the devil and his cohorts, the devil and his angels are looking and they're embarrassed because what he thought was his most prestigious achievement of getting mankind to crucify the Messiah ended up being his biggest foolish issue. And when we magnify that to the hilt, then he is just completely embarrassed. But then you have the holy angels that say, yeah, come rule and reign over us. We're tired of being under the bondage that we're under. That's what our program is all about. It, Israel's program is about being under bondage on this earth. And if you're caught up during that, then you have a, you have a different mindset than what a godly mindset regarding what bondage we're delivering, what realm from, and that's the heavenly places. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. Not just to eat and get full. The, the eating can be abused and one, uh, can be abused by just getting full. That's what the kings, the last thing I'll say, the kings, and you see in the Old Testament, they just eat, get full, have parties and all these things. It can be utilized for that or it can be utilized by just having a gathering uh, and, and having food, but the fellowship around God's word and to make that open show to the heavenly places. That's what they're going to be doing in the kingdom. When there's no reason for them to eat physically in that kingdom, they're going to be eating in celebration of the word of God and what that's accomplished. Let's do that now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look at this wonderful issue um, of what you did on the cross and what it provides. It provides for us to be in Christ, but the capstone of being in Christ is to be qualified for a position of authority and leave no one behind. As we're good soldiers of Jesus Christ, as, you, as Paul tells Timothy, we don't leave a man behind. We don't leave, leave a, a woman behind. We don't leave a child behind. But that we would all go forth and be those good soldiers and attain unto the, the, the reward that you provided us to be able to attain unto. We know that the Apostle Paul get it. He got that crown of righteousness. And he also said it's, it's available for all those that love his appearing, all those that love the Lord Jesus Christ and what he appeared for to the Apostle Paul. And that ultimately was for us to give us an inheritance in the heavenly places. And in that inheritance, um, a position of rulership and authority in the heavenly place. And the grandeur of all that is worthy to be contemplated and to think upon all the days of our life. And may we not allow the world and the many obstacles and strongholds that are established by the course of this world to drown out that issue, but rather be so focused upon it that it provides for us to be the light in this perverse and crooked nation and in this world. Things aren't going to get better. You tell Solomon that in Ecclesiastes. The course of this world, we cannot stop. But yet, we can be educated by you. And we can redeem the time unto your honor and glory. Father, I do pray if anyone's here listening and does not trust the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the first step, is that they would trust that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. And if they do that, they can possess eternal life having the forgiveness of all their sins, past, present, and future, and be imputed your righteousness. They just need to have faith in what Christ did for them on that cross. And once they do that, may they go through their edification process, understand that there's two programs in your word. They need to rightly divide those things, one with the nation of Israel that they're not a part of. They should learn, but they're not a part of. And one with the church, the body of Christ, set forth in Paul's epistles. And within his epistles has a design to edify us, not just for any old reason but for a specific designed purpose that they can attain unto I do pray that that would be their course instead of the course of this world Father we thank you for this time of grace giving we don't give grudgingly or on necessity 
but willfully and cheerfully according to your, your word has worked effectually in them. Not my enthusiasm, not my zeal and zest for these things, but that your word would work effectually in them. And they give in response to that. And we thank you for this time that we can memorialize and commemorate your death. And not only that it provided us eternal life, but it provided for us reward in that life. And that we can show that to the heavenly places right now. We thank you for all these things that you've provided us for in your Son, whom we are now in. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.